ah, DB Sweeney is here. He, Herbie, he he knows how to do this. Like this is what he does. He's doing voiceover work all the time now. Good to have an expert on the mic, though. It is. If you want, you can move your chair. I usually sit down when I interview people. Oh, so okay. if you want to match me and be comfortable. I'm, I'm so happy that you're here, man. I thank you so much for coming to hang out. Thank you. It's exciting for me. I'm a fan of the show. I'm a fan of yours. Thank you. That's Your very dulcet nice of you to tones. Say. I do my great best. Voice. Well, let's, before we get into everything, I do want to ask you about doing voiceover work now and all the stuff that, whether you're doing characters, you're doing stuff for the, the, the own network. How does, how does one get tapped on the shoulder by Oprah to come and do voiceover work? You know, it was a it was a really great honor. Like when she started the the network, she obviously could have her pick of anybody in the business. And I guess it came down to me and a couple of females. And she was like, you know what, we kind of have a women's network, and uh, we don't want to sound too female, so let's go with uh, with DB. And I, I guess it was a it was a real competitive process that I had to submit a bunch of samples. And uh, I was very honored because I'm a fan of Miss Oprah too. And uh, it was great to you know to be living here in Chicago and and being the voice of own. Chicago, you're really from New York, right? I am from New York, but uh, you know, I used to come here a lot during the, the golden age of uh, you know when MJ was uh, was destroying everybody, and uh, Chris Chellers, my buddy, was a captain of the Blackhawks, and I come visit a lot, and it was always my favorite place to go. So I just thought when my kids were about to be teenagers, and I was like, I want to live in Chicago. I saw you give tips on breaking your accent that I I had never seen before in working with this. So I don't mind if I, I wouldn't mind if you would share. The the pencil in yeah, the mouth yeah. thing? Well, you know, I met a casting director real early on in New York, and I came from Long Island, and I sounded like, for fans of Entourage, I sounded like E. I was like, you know, let's get, let's get some coffee. You know, I need my cup of coffee right now. And and so this guy, this casting director said to me, you don't look like you're from New York, so you can't sound like you're from New York. And I really didn't know what he meant until 20 years later when I saw The Sopranos. He was saying, you're not going to get hired to be on The Sopranos. You're going to get hired as a guy from Winnipeg or a guy from Iowa you know, that you don't look like that idea of what everybody thinks a New Yorker is, like that Guido thing. So I, I understood it late, but I, at the time I took the advice, even though I didn't understand it. And um, so he recommended that you put, uh, not him, a voice coach that I worked with recommended that you take a pencil and you put it in your teeth and you try to speak as clearly as you can and ar as articulately as you can. And you start to learn what you sound like to the rest of the world. And then you take the pencil out and then you try to do like a strong accent from where you're from and then another accent from like England or something with the pencil and without the pencil. And, you know, I, I felt like I should mix business with pleasure. So I changed the pencil to a wine cork. And of course, you had to liberate the wine cork. So it, it became, uh, you know, it became more of a fun activity. Yeah. So so how when it comes to you like training your voice, like how much time do you spend doing that? Or have you done all of those things? And now it's just give me the script and I can rip and read. Well, a lot of times they want you to sort of not be a character where you have an accent. If there is an accent call for, I'll spend as much time as I need to to really get it down. Like a few years ago, I did Under Milkwood, which uh, is famous for Richard Burton. It's, it's a Welsh play, and I had to sound like a Welshman. So that was a lot of work. That's a really hard accent. And uh, But generally speaking, uh, at the time, I just wanted to get rid of this Long Island accent. So I spent about an hour and a half to two hours a day, you know, not all of it in front of the mirror. Sometimes I was driving a taxi for a lot of, a lot of that time. So I, I'd be looking in the rearview mirror trying to look at the parts of my mouth moving and trying to understand how I could sound less like, you know, uh, a guy from uh, Rockville Center. So, so you've made this your home. Why did you decide to make this your home? I love the people in the Midwest. And I, like I said, when I used to come back here, it was, you know, it was a great period of time in the Chicago in the nineties. And, and I made so many friends here and I just thought, you know, I was, I was always New Yorker at heart and LA was not a good fit for me. You know, I have friends out there as well, but you know, I said to my wife, let's, you know, let's move back East. Uh, and I was kind of saying New York, she was like, ah, we already did New York. Let's, uh, you know, let's try Chicago. Cause she'd always heard me talk about it so much. And she'd had good experiences here as well. DB Sweeney joining me here in studio. We got to talk a lot about his career and the great roles that he's played. One of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is we're getting close to the field of dreams game between the White Sox and the Yankees. And people obviously know that you played Shoeless Joe Jackson in Eight Men Out. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. How do you feel about this kind of the, more storytelling about Shoeless Joe you know, through the movie itself, but also now with this game and the type of spotlight that it's going to put on Joe's career? 
it's it's such a great story, and uh, you know, I guess half the half the, uh, the the problem with becoming a legend is you got to have a great nickname. And so, you know, Shoeless Joe is like, even if you don't know the story of why he's called that, or you know, it's just such an iconic figure. And I'm really uh, excited and proud to to be associated with that. And uh, you know, people have different opinions about whether he should be in the Hall of Fame or not. And I think it's become more and more difficult to keep him and Pete Rose and others like Roger Clemens out of the Hall of Fame because. You know, it, it, nobody's really uh, 100% pure. And, and there are guys in the Hall of Fame, obviously, who are role models and great characters. But I think that it's, it really should be about your achievements as an athlete. And, uh, you know, so I think it gets harder and harder to keep Shoeless Joe out of the Hall of Fame. I know we're going 35 years back on this, but when you were prepping for that role, what did you do? How did you get yourself ready for it? Well, I thought it was really important at that time. This is before Kevin Costner, who did such a great job uh, playing a minor league catcher in Bull Durham. Nobody had ever really effectively, in my opinion, as a former baseball player, played a baseball player believably in a movie. The great Robert De Niro uh, in Bang the Drum Slowly is laughable. Michael Moriarty, another great actor, terrible. You know, So it was a whole history. And Gary Cooper, one of my favorite actors in Pride of the Yankees, was terrible. So I thought there was a real opportunity to be an actor from a baseball background to really knock it out of the park. And then uh, uh, John Sales, but I, I, I wasn't a left-handed hitter. So I said to John Sales, the director, can we do it like they did in Pride of the Yankees where they reversed art directed everything and then he, ran, he hit righty and ran to third and they flipped the negative and made it look like a lefty. Obviously a lot more expenses doing that. He said, we don't have the money for that. Uh, Eight Men Out was kind of a lower budget movie. So he said, you have six months, you know, just do the best you can. So I was like, okay, that makes me a professional baseball player. So I'm going to go and learn to hit lefty. So I, I played for a little while with the San Francisco Giants rookie team in California. They let me work out and play with them. And then I thought to experience what Joe Jackson would have experienced in 1919 and in his career when players were, there were no trainers, they were on buses and trains and, you know, it was very unglamorous compared to today. I thought that sounds like a ball. So I spent a summer with the Kenosha twins just up the road from here and uh, just had one of the greatest summers of my life and, uh, you know, played with them. I wasn't able to play in games except for one at bat. And, uh, but I, every day I took batting practice and lived the life of a minor league baseball player. I was going to ask you about Ray Liotta. When you talk about you know it not looking good on screen, where you're sitting there with Ray Liotta because he's an amazing actor, and you're going, Shoeless Joe wasn't right-handed, Ray. So how do you feel knowing that you've both played the same character, but you actually went and became a baseball player, and Ray didn't? Well, I mean, Ray's a great actor, and I know Ray. I really, I'm really fond of Ray. Ray, and you know, Goodfellas speaks for itself. And you know, I think there's times I've had jobs where I get slammed in there on a Friday night, and you got to just make the best of it. And there's times like Eight Men Out where you have six months. So I mean, I don't know what Ray's situation was, and and I think he's really good in the movie. And you know, I'm flattered when people say that you know I had the more believable baseball playing Shoeless Joe Jackson. That's awesome, but. You know, I, I I don't really feel like any rivalry with Ray because, you know, man, I wish I was in Goodfellas. <laughs> and what what other, like, when you start to look, and I'm going to get back to Aitman now because I have a couple more questions for you on that. And we're talking with D.B. Sweeney here on The Score. What movies have you, that you were close on? Were you like, man, maybe you passed on it or they said you weren't right and you were like, I really wish I was in that movie? Well, when my kids were little, I really regretted that I didn't do uh, to play the part opposite Joe Pesci in Home Alone. They had asked me to do that. And obviously, uh, Daniel Stern was phenomenal. I just didn't get the movie. I thought, you know, it's a little silly. And, you know, Macaulay Culkin kind of makes that whole thing explode. And, and it's great. And John Hughes is great. And so I certainly regret that around Christmas time when that thing comes on TV. I bet. <laughs> I bet. What movie are you proudest of? Like the work that you did, the commitment to it or even television appearances what's what makes you proud when you see it pop back up well that was a part of my career where uh right around eight men out after that i did lonesome dove and i didn't know how to ride a horse so learning how to ride a horse not just believably but to, to become very skilled at it i'm really proud of the way that turned out and i think robert duvall is the greatest american actor and so to be alongside him in that show is really uh, a source of great pride for me it's one of the great scripts by larry mcmurtry and Tommy Lee Jones. I mean, it's just, you go on and on. That cast is Danny Glover, some of our greatest actors all doing this iconic Western. That was great. But the cutting edge, I think, is is the one I'm most proud of because it was very difficult to shoot figure skating. And, you know, even if you had great hockey players and figure skaters, which Moira Kelly and I were not, um, it's hard to get the camera up close because we're used to watching figure skating on TV. It's kind of a full body shot and it's wide and it's, you know, it's graceful and elegant. But when you're doing a movie, you want to hear what people are saying to each other under their breath while they're doing that. 
And so just to get the camera close enough and have us believably moving was an incredible challenge. And, uh, and I really, I'm very proud of the movie of the way it's aged and, uh, the script by Tony Gilroy is phenomenal. And, uh, you know, so I, I guess those three, eight men out, uh, lonesome dumb on the cutting edge are my three that I'm proudest of. I know that you play hockey, but had you skated before the cutting edge? No, it sounds like a broken record that I had to learn these skills three movies in a row, but it's true. I, and, uh, they, they knew I was athletic and they were sort of like, they were going to use a lot of stunt doubles and they, they hadn't really figured out exactly how they were going to do it. But Moira and I, neither of us skated. We're both from Long Island. And at that time I was living in New York city and they rented out a whole rink that was dedicated to Moira and I learning to skate. They had ballet teachers, they had figure skating instructors, they had hockey instructors. And it was like this crash course hockey school for three months for me. And to a certain extent, figure skating and Moira was doing figure skating. So she and I had this incredible immersive rehearsal experience that allowed us to really experience what these characters would have done growing up crammed into three months. And it, it just paid off such dividends when we got on the set. Cause we had this history together that, you know, you could just turn on the camera and we look at each other and it's like, Oh, that's, they, they've been competing to get to be the better skater, even though we're both terrible skaters still at the first month, we're competing to be better than the other one. And that was the whole essence of the movie. Do people still yell toe pick at you? If I trip in an airport, I'll hear five people yell it. I mean, I think I can make, I can make 90 more movies. It's going to say toe pick on my gravestone. I mean, there's no getting around at this point. That movie, I mean, we're coming up on the 30th anniversary of, yeah. of that movie. Why do you think it touched a nerve with people? Like, that's a lot. Like, I know people who have that movie on VHS and disc. Like, it's a lot of people's favorite flick. Why do you think it reached people? Well, it starts with um, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Tony Gilroy, the writer, who's, who went on to write the Born Identity movies. He's one of the great writers in Hollywood now. Everybody agrees on that but this was his first script and he put a lot of himself into it i think there's also the romantic comedy thing everybody loves to revisit those and there's a you know a dog and cat vibe to every romantic comedy from taming the shrew on down and the idea of, of applying that uh, model with a hockey player who's sort of like this gruff physical person and the figure skater for the feminine it's it's very classically structured in a sense and they made a lot of really good choices about it and there's no profanity. There's very little profanity. There's very little, uh, there's no violence. There's very little about it that's, that would make you uh, uncomfortable on a sexual level. Like you could watch it with your grandmother or, you know, it, it, it really appeals to all ages the way mo movies used to, to all the time do. And now I feel like movies are very much balkanized. Like here's a movie for teenagers. Here's a movie for people over 50 that vote for Academy Awards. Here's a movie, you know, for this audience or that audience. And I feel like that's unfortunate because when you find that one movie, whether it's it's a wonderful life. And I'm not comparing the cutting edge. It's a wonderful life, but it's a, the same way where everybody can watch it all the time and, and have repeat viewings. I think that's given it the longevity it's got with Moira. Was the chemistry immediate or was that stuff that you guys had to work through as actors? For me, it clicked in on about the sixth day because figure skates are extremely uncomfortable. They're very tight. They got that stupid toe pick on the front. You're always falling down. It's just like in the movie. And it's a pain in the neck. And hockey skates, they get molded to your feet. They're a little more comfortable because they're more built to protect you from pucks than to give you the absolute perfect contact with the ice, the way a figure skate is. So even though, as I said, MGM rented out this entire rink, it was ours. And when Moira and I went on the ice, it was she and I and the figure skating instructor. It was usually Evelyn Kramer. And they had rules at the rink where you weren't allowed to have hockey skates on the ice during figure skating hours. And vice versa. Like somebody made that rule because there's a rivalry between hockey skaters and figure skaters because the figure skaters land these jumps and take divots out of the ice that mm -hmm. pisses off the hockey players. And, and just the figure skaters want their own time with no hockey players. So there was a sign at the rink that said that exactly that no hockey skates during figure skating hours. We had already rented out the whole building. It was our building. So Moyer was like, you can't have hockey skates on now because it's nine 15. And I was like, it's our barn. And she, she was like, but that's not the rule. And I was like, I'm leaving them on. And that's the essence of the movie that I would just leave the skates on just to piss her off. And then she'll find a way to piss me off. Like she, whatever, stick a, a broken piece of a pretzel with mustard in my street shoes. And I come home to that because I left my hockey skates on. It's like, thank you very much. And so it just became this very organic, you know, one-upsmanship that we competed right through the rehearsals and right through the movie. And I think it really is part of the movie. Let me go back to, to eight men out, but before I, I get you out of here and I appreciate you coming down, by the way, I know that you listen, but I appreciate that you actually came down to the studio that cast. Like when you go back and look at the cast of eight men out, you guys must've had a blast on that set. 
We really did. It was in Indianapolis we were filming it because they couldn't find a stadium even at that point in the, in the late 80s that looked anything like stadiums looked in the 1910s. So uh, Bush Stadium in Indianapolis was a, a AAA team at that time for the Montreal Expos, and they hadn't redone the stadium. So it actually looked a lot like those stadiums would have looked uh, architecturally, and it was the best fit. So, But anyway, that meant that we were staying in some really crappy hotel uh, they, I think it used to be actually uh, government subsidized housing that they converted to a hotel right before we got there. So it was really beat up. And the, the effect of that was that we were all marooned in this crappy hotel together. So the card games we had were just epic. Like, you know, you, it'd be like they'd go all night and then it'd be like Charlie Sheen would be like, oh, geez, I've got a scene. Deep, take my seat. I'm going to I'm going to run out. I got to do three lines of dialogue. I'll be right back. And, and it literally went on like that for 10 weeks, this endless card game. Everybody had dinner together every night in the hotel, and they used to show dailies, you know, the footage from the day before every night, and it became a thing where everybody, I never, any other movie I was on never had this happen, where the entire cast and crew would assemble in this screening room of the hotel and watch what we shot the day before, and, you know, it was just great. It was very uh, a great bonding for the whole group, and uh, everybody was really proud of what we were filming, and so, uh, you know, we, we really did have a good time every minute on that movie. Telling the story of the 1919 White Sox, for someone who's clearly a sports fan like you are, and I know that Charlie's huge sports fan and Cusack's from here. So you have all these elements playing in. When you look at it now, like in its totality, when you compare it with the book and what you guys are able to put on film and having John Sales be there and be Ring Lardner in, in the movie, what do you think is the, the what should be taken away from the 1919 White Sox story? Well, I think, uh, you know, sports belongs to the fans. And I think even today there could be more pushback from our fans. Like this, this is a, well, the greatest sports town in America, in my opinion. It's the greatest town in many ways, greatest food town. There's a whole re lot of reasons why Chicago is the best. But sports is, to me, indisputable, which is hard for a New Yorker to say. And the reason I would say that is, is um, you talk to a Bears fan, and it is, I think when you get right down to it, it's Cubs have had success, the Blackhawks have had success, the Whitehawks. This is a Bears town. I mean, when you get right down to it, I mean, that's in the DNA of the town. And when you talk to people about Bears football, it means so much to them. And it's not like talking about, like in New York, you're a Yankee fan, you're a Met fan. Yeah, so what? Here, you're a Cubs fan or you're a Sox fan, and it's it can be a problem, you know, if you're on the wrong side of that. So I, I just love the passion that people have. And, you know, I look at, you know, some of the way sports has become such a business. I would love to see the fans get together and say, to the White Sox, to the Cubs, to the Blackhawks. You know what? On Tuesday nights, we're not paying 12 bucks for beers. It's seven. Take it or leave it. And then figure out a way to not go. One game. And just so the fans can have a little bit more of a voice because a lot of the people that really built these things, like not back as far as 1919, but the people who built the the the, the Cub Blue, the, you know, the Blackhawks, the having the Indian head on, you know, it's the people that built the, the value of these brands, a lot of them are being priced out. And I think that it would be great for some of those people to find a voice. You have social media and just say, you know what? And, and there are some deals you can get. But I went to a Kane County Cougars game the other night and it was like, you know, it was a reasonable, all the prices were reasonable and you saw a lot more families. And I just thought that's what, when I first went to, you know, Yankee games and Met games in New York, that's more what it was like. But you go to a, a sporting event now and it's, it's very, very corporate. And, and, you know, you don't see a lot of families of four kids because who could afford that? How many takes did it take to get the say it ain't so scene done? It was it was very quick, a couple takes. Uh I that that never happened. That, so that was one of the only arguments I had with John Sales was like that really never happened. So let's let's find a way the true story of what happened that that was inspired by that a sports writer spun into that story was Charlie Sheen's character Hap Felsch and Shoeless Joe Jackson. The White Sox played the next season. They were getting ready to throw the next World Series. So they weren't as innocent obviously as they're portrayed in the movie. They threw the World Series, and they were going to throw it again in 1920. And Shoeless Joe Jackson was hitting 390 in August. And at that point, it was starting to come out in the media that these guys did what they did the year before. And But the fans were behind them, and they were saying no. So and one of the games that players would sometimes not dress at the hotel, they would dress. Uh, they would not dress at the ballpark, they'd dress at the hotel. So Joe Jackson and Hap Fels are walking away from the ballpark in their uniforms and there's 30 kids behind them yelling messages of support. Like it didn't happen. We know it didn't happen. Joe, you got to tell them it didn't happen. And some of the kid may or may not have said, say it ain't so Joe. And that, but it was this, this, this band of urchins following the ball players out of the ballpark, which to me is such a better scene. 
uh, than the, but I, John Sales was in a bind because everybody thinks that moment happened and it's the iconic memory of, and, but it was a little too sweet and cloying for me the way it was in the movie. I, I like the other one that's rough and tumble. We see Hap Felsch's face and Joe Jackson's face and on their face, the kids are all saying, we know it didn't happen. And on their faces, you know, it happened. We're, we're dirtbags. When I look at your career, I see evolution. I, I see it. And you look up DB Sweeney and you look at all the different things that you've done in your career. I go, this is a guy who didn't just stay in one lane. How important was it to you to diversify? as a performer, as a creative? Well, I, very early on, I felt like I wanted to prove that I could do more than one thing. And so I definitely went out of my way to find roles that were, you know, di divergent from the last thing I had done. And a lot of them, and I love sports, so a lot of them ended up where I did different sports movies. Like we did Heaven is a Playground here in Chicago. and You versus Akeem, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> we were trying to figure out... He, I mean, what a great man, by the way. What a great man. And and I uh, had so much fun being around. He was only there for a couple of days. We had a few dinners together and, you know, and it was during Ramadan and it was amazing because he said, I didn't know much about Ramadan. And he said, uh, yeah, let's have dinner, but it has to be, it was very late at night. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess he's clubbing it or something. I don't know. It was like, but it was very, it was a religious observance that he would not eat until after a certain time. And, and he was just a fascinating guy. You know, he was a soccer goalie who never played basketball. He was like 11th grade in high school. And then he became a keem and, and, uh, uh, the answer to one of the greatest, uh, sports trivia questions of all time, like name the two guys drafted ahead of MJ and most people get him and they don't get the other one. So, uh, you got it though, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, you know, cause it, it, you end yeah. up, you end up uh, having to have that conversation with people. And it's just like, you feel really bad because it's like, at least Akeem got, championships yeah you yeah. know but but wait i want to go back to the diversification yeah. thing like why was that such an important part of what you wanted your career to be to, to be like you know what i'm okay doing television i'm okay doing animated i'm okay doing voiceover stuff like that that i love that you're doing that yeah well you know i remember early on they you know i was i was about 25 or 26 years old when i first started popping in the movies and they always try to position me as like this this cute boy like or whatever and i was like you know like and i thought man my sister's had like that david cassidy poster on. i don't want to be that crap you know I, i'm sure he's a great guy by the way i don't know anything about him but i just didn't i thought i want to i want to be able to do this for 25 or 30 years and then when i'm 50 i can be gene hackman you know that's kind of the way or robert ryan or you know those guys that i really admired so i felt like i don't want to you know just be like a product that they plug into the next teeny bopper thing i want to i want to show that i can do a lot of different characters and have a longevity and, you know, I guess that was a pure notion, but it was not really the best career thought. I mean, because, you know, they slam you into a matrix or something like that. Then you get to do all the movies you want to do. Not that I was up for the matrix or anything. I'm just pulled that out of the air. I mean, Spawn. Yeah, Spawn was great. I mean, I really enjoyed that. And one of my three movies with Martin Sheen, who's a, you know, wonderful guy. And, uh, you know, that was that was a really good experience. Michael Jai White is, a you know, I mean. He's he, a force, man. He's like, I mean, of all the people in combat movies today, he's probably the most legit. And I know that's a big statement, but I mean, he's, when you stand next to that guy, you're like, you know, you realize he can take you apart in about four seconds. And uh, I, he just puts a lot of effort into it. Like I mentioned Keanu, Keanu earlier. Keanu has become the go-to weapons guy in movies, and that's not an accident. Like, he's worked his butt off, you know, um, learning to do speed reloads. And so when you watch those John Wick movies, he's so proficient with weapons. And Michael Jai has that in uh, in combat, you know, that that he he's such a uh, uh, proficient guy in so many disciplines, and he's such a specimen that when he gets into a fight in a movie, it's like, that's what it would be like. And I think it's a real, I think he should be a bigger star than he is. But, you know, there's time left on the clock. DB, I really appreciate you coming down here and being a part of the show today. This was awesome. I'm, I'm yeah. glad I get to talk to the guy that embodied Shoeless Joe Jackson. Well, thank you. If, if, I, if you don't mind, I just wanted to throw out to any uh, Chicago actors that are listening. I'm running for SAG National Board, the Chicago seat, because I, I feel like Chicago doesn't get enough of a voice at the table. And I've never done anything for my union, and my union's been really good to me. Residual checks have come in in bad months. And I know a lot of actors in this town that, you know, they don't always get the, you know, the long end of the stick. And, and I just feel like I want to put in a little time. I'm not becoming a politician. I'll probably be two and done or four and done, but I want to speak up for the, the Chicago actors. So if anybody's going to vote for, uh, you know, the national board in the next coming week, I hope you'd consider throwing my name in there. Vote for DB Sweeney. I actually have a sad card.
<laughs> nice. Well, I, I hope I, I hope I won one vote here you today. Won one vote. All right, a hundred percent. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for for giving us a lot of great entertainment over the lifetime of your career. And I appreciate you coming in and being in studio with me. Thank you. I'd love to do it again sometime. I really am a fan of the show. I think that we we can make that happen for sure. That is DB Sweeney. We need to take a break, but I feel like it was totally worth it to be late. Back after this on the.